Luoyang, December 27th, 683 CE. There are strange signs and omens in the capital, for within the palace, Emperor Gaozong lies dying, already his massive mausoleum being built. His heir was selected, though not without difficulty. So many misfortunes and cruel misadventures had befallen his sons of late. But he did have an heir, and on that young man's shoulders would rest the legacy of Gaozong's reign. The ongoing war in Korea, border clashes with the Tibetan Empire, military backing to the exiled Emperor of Persia, and a dangerous and complicated religious situation where multiple faiths vied for imperial favor. However, Gaozong closes his eyes reassured, because despite his son's youth, the true ruler of China would be the same one that's been ruling it for decades. The woman behind the curtain, destined to one day join him in that great mausoleum, Empress Wu Zontian. Thanks so much to Factor for keeping us history-loving beans well-fed fast. Emperor Gaozong reigned for 17 years after the mountaintop ritual we discussed at the end of last episode, but it was clear for much of that time that he was not fully, or even primarily, running the country. Wu was a constant presence in the throne room, sitting beside and slightly behind Gaozong, screened from sight by the customary curtain of beads and pearls that was supposed to shield her from modesty. This allowed her to hear the matters brought before the Emperor and, you know, Wizard of Oz style, whisper into his ear what the correct ruling should be. Pay no attention to that woman behind the curtain! Except, you know, people did. In fact, it was so well known that Wu was serving as the unofficial regent of the Empire that the pair were popularly known as the Two Sages. At one point in 675, Gaozong's illness got so bad that he considered officially and publicly making Wu his regent, but advisors counseled against what would have seemed a radical act. So the two just stumbled along until the end of his life, with Wu essentially navigating the empire through a time that encompassed both the empire's greatest danger and its greatest glory. As we mentioned earlier, the empire was simultaneously fighting battles in hot spots that stretched from Korea to Central Asia. And not all of these wars were successful. Wu wasn't some sort of military genius, but even when they didn't win, they were still well-managed enough that losing them didn't sink the empire as a whole. And part of that was due to diplomacy. It should be noted that during the ritual of 666, the Tang hosted high-level guests from several Korean states, the Khmer Kingdom of Cambodia, Persia, India, and the Umayyad Caliphate. That suggests an enormous and complicated diplomatic reach. Though things were not exactly simple on the domestic front either, since China's religious landscape was changing in the 17th century. Buddhism had arrived in China centuries before, but it was only in the reign of Gaozong's father, Emperor Taizong, that the monk Xuanzang had traveled on his epic journey to India, returning with and translating what would be the foundational sutras of Chinese Mahayana Buddhism. Which, of course, you can see our series on here, and please do, it's one of my absolute favorites lately. But the point is that Buddhism was kind of the new kid on the block, and not as entrenched in power structures as the Confucianism of the elder scholar class or the powerful rituals and sorcery of Taoism. In truth, all three were vying for control, patronage, and imperial attention, and really the court did frequently engage with all three religions in a syncretic fashion. The imperial court was awash in astrologers, Taoist sorcerers, Confucian numerologists, and Buddhist monks, all regularly interpreting and reinterpreting prophecies and omens. Because while the emperor's position was a political one, it was considered spiritual as well. He was no mere king, but a cosmic axis who harmonized heaven, earth, and human beings. And Wu wanted to imbue herself with some of that sweet religious power. As a result, she specifically went out of her way to spread her patronage among the religious sects. She funded her own group of Confucian officials to produce works of history and poetry, including biographies of great Chinese women, and helped expand and reorganize the civil service examination system to make it more meritocratic. This decision to expand reliance on examinations for official postings would shape China for much of its later history. She also sponsored new publications of Taoist texts and got them added as part of the reading material for the exams, raising the prestige of the Taoist beliefs, frequently more popular amongst commoners. Yet, her greatest patronage was for Buddhism. And while she practiced all three religions, it's generally believed that Wu was largely a Buddhist. Perhaps she took a liking to the religion because the treatment of women was more equitable and it didn't contain the bias against female power that many old guard Confucians held. Despite making several bequests to monasteries in both her and her husband's name, her most lasting impact was on the Longman Grottoes, 
a series of limestone caves where Buddhists carved religious scenes. That work had already been going on for two centuries before Wu added to it, but the new cave she ordered excavated and carved initiated a new era of Tang-era statuary at the site. Wu's cave, roughly the size of a church, was carved out largely between 672 and 674, and contains a 56-foot Buddha that remains an enduring symbol of China. It's considered some of the finest religious art from the Tang Dynasty, and today is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Unusual for the era, it also includes a significant number of women amongst its carved figures. These sponsorships of religious organizations successfully tied Wu to the divine power of the throne, cementing her personally as possessing part of that spiritual legitimacy rather than having it merely be a reflection of her husband. Her husband, who again was gradually dying, with his succession uncertain. At this point, Gao Zong and Wu had three surviving sons, though his eldest was actually rumored to be Wu's nephew. See, according to court gossip, Wu's sister had carried out an affair with Gao Zong upon coming to court, and the crown prince was adopted by Wu to prevent a scandal. He'd also supposedly had an affair with her daughter, being Wu's niece. Man, Gao Zong, why's everything gotta be all weird incest stuff with you? Anyway, both Wu's sister and niece then tragically died in a case of accidental poisoning. At which point, Wu unmasked their killers as <gasps> the two brothers she hated most. How could they? Well, into the news. Therefore, when her eldest son, maybe nephew, the crown prince also died, traditional historians assumed Wu poisoned him. However, modern scholars now rule it was in fact natural causes. So their next son was named the crown prince, but he too fell to intrigue. After the royal couple's favorite Taoist sorcerer was assassinated, and a raid on the prince's chambers discovered a cache of weapons and armor suggesting a coup, he was demoted, exiled, and eventually forced to commit suicide. So, when Gao Zong died, it was their 28-year-old third son who took the throne as Emperor Zhang Zong, with his mother ruling as Empress Dowager and Regent until the mourning period was over. Or, you know, forever. Because within two months, it was clear that Wu had no intention of giving up her power to Zhang Zong. In fact, when he and his wife Empress Wei tried to get him to displace Wu as an advisor in favor of her father, Wu essentially triggered a coup and expelled them. Zhang Zong and Wei were shipped to house arrest in the provinces, despite her being heavily pregnant. She gave birth on the road in deep winter, and Zhang Zong was forced to tear off pieces of his imperial robe to wrap the child in to prevent it freezing. Meanwhile, his younger brother now took the throne as Emperor Ruzong. But truthfully, by now the mask was off. A virtual prisoner in the palace, Ruzong's movements were heavily restricted, and his name and seal not used on official documents and proclamations. Due to his speech impediment, you see, Wu translated his orders. Now, at age 60, Wu Zotian, both literally and metaphorically, emerged from behind the curtain to rule in public. She inaugurated her reign, or you know her sons, with the Act of Grace in 684, renaming many palaces and offices while changing the court regalia to make it more reminiscent of the early Zhou dynasty, which the Tang saw as an ancient golden age. This came with a heavy program of criminal pardons, tax relief, charity, and religious leave for troops. She also hatched a recruitment drive, staffing a reorganized government with the able men that owed their elevation to her. There was a small rebellion by a religious leader who'd previously made a hoax claim of glowing light guiding him to a Buddhist statue, but she crushed that no problem. And to keep the people happy, she placed a great four-chambered urn at the center of the capital. The first chamber was to recommend officials or legislation. The second was for complaints against the government. The third was to report acts of injustice. And the fourth? The fourth was to denounce traitors. And boy, oh boy, was that fourth chamber going to be getting busy real soon. Man, I know something about being busy. And I'm not even trying to root out traitors in my empire yet. Good thing great food is something I never have to spend much time on, thanks to the folks over at Factor. Factor is my favorite ready-to-eat meal delivery service that's been sending me tasty food for over a year now, so I've never had to worry about what I'm eating for lunch or dinner. Each meal is ready in two minutes with no prep, no mess, and my favorite, no cleanup. Just really great food ready for me when I have time to eat it. It's that dang simple. Each week, I review Factor's rotating menu and pick what I'm feeling from their mouth-watering meals and add-on options, and holy moly, smoothies are back, baby! Hell yeah! And they have so many options to choose from, I can always be sure that everyone in my household is going to get the food that they love fast. For instance, yesterday I just devoured their sweet potato grits and sage chicken and washed it down with one of their tasty new wellness shots. Wait, are you supposed to actually shoot it? 
and the time I saved actually helped me stick to my New Year's resolution of getting outside more. Fetch the ball, Aslo! I don't know, man, it's a dog thing. Right now, you can get your first Factor Box for 50% off at Factor75.com by clicking the link below and using the code EXTRACREDITS50. Meaning it is tasty task time. Get fast and flavorful meals that you'll absolutely love here. And then once dinner's done, check out our next savory video selection here. The biggest bean thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angelo Valenciana, Arcalite Games, Dominic Valenciana, Izzy Coin, Joseph Blame, Kuyakoy, and Michael Hoggett for being our legendary patrons.